A belated Happy New Year, our first program of 2023. Welcome to Moral Side of the News. We're glad you're alongside. I'm John Blim with the WHAS Crusade for Children. With me, as always, is another distinguished panel, Reverend Harriet Aikens Bandman, Centenary United Methodist Church, New Albany. Reverend Sally McLean, Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. Rabbi Emerita Galia Rooks, The Temple. And Father Bill Hammer, St. Margaret Mary and St. William Catholic Churches. Better policing has been a focus in Louisville for years, especially in the wake of Breonna Taylor's death. Now, a new interim police chief has introduced her plan. Jacqueline Gwynne Villaroyal outlined three points, building relationships, transparency, and cooperation, plus officer recruiting. So turning to our panel, what do you want to see from a new police chief? Living on this side of the river and watching it, I appreciate her three points that are very focused. And the other piece that inspires me about her leadership is the, the relationship between citizens and the police department has been very fractured, but yet she's still clinging to a hope and looking to that future where that hope lives in fulfillment, that things can be better. And then she's already digging her heels in to say, this is how it starts. It starts in a barbershop in conversations with people. And, and I love that, that simple step that she's giving, which I think would just spread to other folks doing the same kind of simple acts of let's communicate, let's build some bridges and move forward to make what has happened um, a lesson instead of the reality of where we sit. Yeah, my thinking similarly is that uh, it's not just unique to the head of the police department, but I mean, anytime a, a, a new leader of any congregation comes in, anytime the leader of a new business comes in, uh, a lot of times you're only going to be as effective, especially for the large operation, you're only going to be as effective as the counselors or advisors that are around you because you can't get all the information on your own. And so one of the things that I will be interested in continuing to watch is if she does set up like advisory panels or how she works even at the local precinct level or whatever, but you don't want to be surrounded by like-minded people either. Again, as a pastor, I, I don't want to be surrounded by like-minded people. I want people who are going to give me, you know, feedback and new ideas and things that, oh, I hadn't thought that way and help me get challenged in a different way of thinking. And that's how I think organizations grow and progress. And so my hope for her is what I would hope for again any leader of any organization with a large number of people. And then the, the principles still apply, whether you're a congregation, a police department, a business, a university, whatever it may be. Yeah, I, I really like some of her goals. Um, Harriet, you were calling them hopes, but I want to call them goals because I more than hope. Um, but she's very committed to transparency, um, very committed to transparency. And I think that that is so important. Um, and, you know, as has been said, she's committed to um, community relations and getting police um, on a more friendly and neighborly basis, interacting, you know, when you're on the beat, you know, or in the, the cruiser that, that, you know, you talk to people, you're not just this threatening force, but, you know, the police are supposed to be on our side, all of us to protect law and order and life. And um, I think that uh, her, her, I think she's kind of appalled, as I would hope anyone would be, that uh, certain records that have been requested for the investigation were not turned over. And she's like, you know, that will not fly. I mean, that's not acceptable. That's not right. Um, so she she seems to be her own woman, not um, I'm just I'm not following in anyone else's footsteps. I mean, obviously she is, but but that she's not going to, you know, follow in that pattern of circle the wagons and protect our own. Um, she she believes in good policing and good police officers and um, is already looking toward recruiting um, at churches and and colleges and things like that <clears throat> so that hopefully we can develop um, and educate 
a meaningful police force here. And by meaningful, I mean that they do the job they need to do, but they do it with a sense of complete respect, equality, and compassion for the human beings that they are hired to protect and serve. I think that the police departments and the community have had a very fractured relationship over the past several years. To rebuild that trust is going to be, I think, the top priority. How, how do we rebuild that trust? I think we've had an interim period which served its purpose, gave everybody the chance to sort of cool off and maybe start again. I, I don't Louisville, the, my understanding of the Louisville Police Department has always had a very good reputation. Um, and I would like to see that um, increase with this new person and, and be able to uh, start again and uh, heal those wounds where we have been so broken. Again, reestablish your building trust. Those are ongoing you know, uh, kind of verbs. And same thing would be again, true, a pastor coming into a new situation. We have a new archbishop, you know, Archbishop Shelton Fab for us Catholics. And you don't just snap your finger and have trust established. It does take time to build. But how you set those blocks in place, I think she's doing a wonderful job right now. Mm -hmm. But I again, love... I don't see where, you know, she's going to immediately get everybody's trust. You have to earn oh. that build. No, I know, nobody was saying that. I'm trying to talk mm -hmm. you know, to the people who are listening into us as well. Yes, that is, I think, her number one goal. It's our number one goal for her. But it's going to take some patience and uh, on everybody's part and willingness to start with the presumption that we're all in this together to make this better, as opposed to start with the assumption of an adversarial relationship. There's no question that, I mean, trust is something that takes years to build and a moment to break. So she's coming into a difficult situation and I, I wish her all the luck in the world. I, I love her, um, what is she calling it? Cuts in conversation where she goes into barbershops and stuff. And, and I think that um, if she and her uh, captains and, and officers and trickle down to everyone um, can be more in touch with, have their finger on the pulse, so to speak, of the community um, and be seen as a blessing and a protection in a way that is really equitable, which, you know, we have had problems. I mean, I've only lived in Louisville for like, what, 34 years or thir I don't know how many years, but uh, there's always been a lack of equity in this community. And I think that um, the Brianna Taylor and Dave McAtee murders um, are highlighting that. I think that the pandemic highlighted that. I think that, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really time for everyone to circle the wagons around the city and county, you know, count the, the greater Louisville community and um, really commit to making a difference. And um, I just pray that she can be the leader that we need to be able to do that. I also like that she's not 100% sure that, that she will um, continue on. You know, she said, I may not be the right person for this job. We'll have to see how it goes. And um, something about that just inspired me. I found it interesting in her comments and that, um, bumping it up to a national level with the DeSantos situation about being transparent and how that seems to be an operative word for our nation right now and being transparent where there is elected officials involved and where there is policing involved and, and where public life it, decisions are made and, and people come together to work together. Um, I found that interesting this week reading this story and thinking nationally. But even transparency is a complex thing along with the truth. That is kind of complex. I mean, again, uh, one of the issues has been, again, withholding records and evidence over time. But I do 
understand the complexity of transparency, particularly at the very moment something happens while immediate, you know, that hour, that day investigations are going on where releasing some information might also tip people off who are not yet part of the investigation or allow people to, like, well, this is what happens so I can change my story. I mean, just our components to transparency that make it as complex as just not a simple word any more than truth is not a simple word. And uh, so to keep working on those kind of things too, by putting in place things that are consistent, that's the issue for me is consistency in it. All right, panel, we're off to a good start on this, the first episode of Moral Side of the News for the new year. So let's move on to our second topic. Louisville Metro Council already has seven new members this year, and soon three more fresh faces could join that group. Metro Council, not the voters, will pick these new members, and some say that's just not right. They say the people should decide in the voting booth. Let's hear your thoughts on that, panel. I'm not sure I understand. I mean, these are just interim positions until we go to the voting booths, right? Yeah, but they're just going to be picked by the council and not a special election. That's the point. I think that's the argument. Right. I mean, the response back is that the people that they are called to represent will not choose their representative. But only so, temporarily. But yes. But uh, I actually think that there's not that much of an issue to try to go ahead and organize you know, a quick little primary that they'll lead to election. Are people prepared to do that? And the response back, the only response back I've heard is, is finances, is money. Well, I, I agree money needs to be spent caring for the needs of others as a higher priority. But again, nobody's been able to yet release what that cost would be. I know they're trying to pick, it's my suggestion, a middle ground of just poll the people, let the poll pick. And I, I strongly I'm, I'm comfortable with that concept because I know polling is wrong at times. <laughs> the concept of being able to establish that my opinion counts for X number of people because of my background, my age, my ethnicity, my all those kind of things, I, I would be reluctant uh, to um, um, suggest polling as a way to pick this representative. But as a um, but I, I would support, go ahead and call a quick election in 30 days. And then it is a temporary to fill the gap of that one period of time. And then the first available election time becomes a more clearly defined run race. That's my opinion. Let the people go ahead and have some input into it. I don't know. It seems time is of an essence. Am I right about that? Um, so if for an interim period, they are selected and then the people could uh, find who really wants these positions and get them to sign up and uh, do the necessary paperwork to run, and then they can be elected that way. I, I'm not sure that I would be opposed because of the time issue of getting something done immediately. Of course, it could create such a rift that it would all be thrown out, but at least in the interim, you could do something. Okay. I wasn't considering I wasn't considering that aspect of it. But yeah, there would be, you know, at the upcoming council meetings, three empty seats. Now, right. in these particular, I think three openings is because they're accepting positions in the administration. Correct. And uh, or at least two of them, I think, were I accepting think so. positions in the administration. <clears throat> uh, it's it's a shame that could not have been announced in sufficient time that yeah. they could still, you know, finish out a little bit more until that immediate election happens you know, the, the primary election. But yeah, you're right. It, it does mean like probably at least, if not uh, six weeks, at least two months, those seats are empty. And that would be a shame to have nobody's voice at the table. And, you know, even, I don't know if I should say this because I don't know if I'm right, but like, hasn't the governor appointed positions that are usually elected just to fill them in temporarily? Like, even a, a, a Senate representative or something. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a lot of precedent for this. It's not, uh, uh, without saying whether it's right or wrong, it, it's not an uncommon thing. All right, very good. I'm gonna move into another story and one you've all heard about by now. 
Everyone knows the story of Damar Hamlin, the Buffalo Bills 24-year-old football player who suffered cardiac arrest during the NFL game versus the Cincinnati Bengals on national television. In a somewhat miraculous recovery, he's been discharged from the hospital and is home now recovering. So turning to our panel, what's your takeaway on this? Injur- injuries, player safety, young people, you know, where do you go with this? It's, it was quite the story that kind of caught everyone's attention. You don't want me to answer that one. When I married my husband, I said I won't have children unless he promised me they wouldn't play football because he played football. His father played football for Woody Hayes, uh, broke his neck, and my husband's broken almost every bone in his body. And yeah, so fortunately, my daughter and my son are not the type to even consider that. But, you know, I think the new concussion protocols are... um, a step in the right direction. Do I think they're working as well as they should be? No, I don't, but I'm at least there's some recognition there of how, how really dangerous this sport is, but you know, what really impressed me? Um, And, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't like football, but I like sports. um, And I, you know, I have my teams and this and that. Um, I loved how the whole country came together especially the Reds and the Bengals. <clears throat> and I mean, everyone was pulling for this kid. Everyone was praying for him. They all had, you know, the number three or holding up three fingers. Um, and, you know, sports really bring out the tribalism in our country. And, you know, in certain settings and certain contexts, you know, and competitions and stuff, that's fine. But I can't help but think in the, in the situation that our country is in right now, there's so much tribalism. There's just to the point where love thy neighbor as thyself has really gone by the by. And, and I was kind of hoping that, that because this did bring so many people together that maybe we could learn from that and say, you know, we're all Americans and we all care, well, Hopefully, we all care about the good of this nation and all of its citizens, all of the people who live here. And we're all inhabitants of this amazing planet that we're in the process of destroying. And can't we all work together and love thy neighbor as thyself? I didn't actually see the event when it happened, but I heard right after it happened. And I was so impressed of the uh, EMS, the the way that they were right there on the scene to take care of the situation. They knew exactly what to do. They were trained. The, the uh, referees were also right there and the officials were there doing the same thing. But what I found most amazing was that the players themselves knew this was a very, very serious injury. And they surrounded him to protect him from the rest of the crowd. And then the decision not to continue the game when you're talking about millions and millions of dollars, I thought was another pull to bring people together. I also have sort of a problem with with football, Galia, and, and some sports. I mean, baseball, I don't know a sport that isn't really dangerous. Uh, because they all have their drawbacks. But I think that there is also something about having it regulated as much as possible to be able to do something immediately as they did for the team people, the other players, all of the players to understand immediately what's going on and that a life is in danger. I I, I just thought it was um, (laughs) a, a real event that taught people how serious this game can be. Yeah, I got the sense, too, of the whole collective national consciousness being impacted by that, again, crossing all kinds of rivalries, uh, which is a real wonder, hyphen, F-U-L-L, you know, full of wonder, (laughs) Uh, a wonderful kind of experience to observe it happening. And uh, also mindful, uh, again, so much of the country, I mean, if, if that had happened practically anywhere except in a stadium with ambulances in the stadium with, you know, all those EMT people there. 
if that had happened in the parking lot and they had had to call somebody three, four minutes, that three, four minutes would have made probably all the difference in the world and not being able to survive as well as he did, which is what the vast majority of people live with, you know, those kind of things. But I do think um, it's also a, a reflection on the place that sports does have uh, in our life, again, the kind of collectively, you know, like for instance, I'm going to go and put my little plug in. I'm a big Green Bay fan. I've never lived oh, in Green Bay. I've never, I mean, I've never been part of, you know, Wisconsin or anything like that. But somehow, going back in history, I can say it was because of Paul Horning. I mean, there's ways I can make those connections. But what happens to any team, even if we're not part of it, you know, how many people around here are Cincinnati fans? How many people around here are Indianapolis fans? How many people around here, you know, because are, are Nashville fans, whatever it may be, uh, because you identify with in a, in a vicarious way. And in some ways, these games are very liturgical. I mean, they got rites, they got rituals, they got things that they do. And right. you want to talk about the truly one of the highest holy days of our nation, <laughs> Super Bowl. <laughs> Is one of the highest holy days of the year. It's well, different. and also to, to go on with your um, ritualistic, uh, look at the incredible outpouring of charity yes. that the whole country was involved in. I mean, I thought that was yes. a beautiful response. I mean, but, you know, this okay, was but, but, but why did it have to take a young man almost dying on the field? I, I've had trouble with this whole story since it hit. I, feel great compassion for him and, and so grateful for trained medical staff and EMS that were there and, and, and moved by his teammates and the other players and how they came together. But on the other hand, I've really wrestled with um, five million dollars given to a charity to buy toys. What about food on the table? Well, we know that there are so many food deserts in this in this country. And what about um, dropping to our knees to pray every night as a nation for Ukraine. Um, uh, I had a, a church member say to me that works in the hospital at, at um, the Children's Hospital in, in Louisville say, there were some children that were cancer patients in the hospital watching the story. And one of the nine-year-olds said, why don't people do that for us in front of the hospital? What do you say to that child? And the child answered the question, is a football player more important than me? Mm -hmm. So that's where I've been sitting with this since the story happened. And um, no, everyone is beloved, you know, is the answer to the child. Everyone is beloved. Um, but you know, I don't know how to answer the rest of that question. I was also upset about the toy thing. Um, and I looked into that and apparently this young man, it always has a charity that he's mm -hmm. focusing on with a GoFundMe kind of thing. Um, and it just happened right now to be the toys because it was right before Christmas or right around Christmas. You know, that was the one, but that's not the only charity he supports. He's but very kind hearted, very kind hearted. But I, I hear you, food. You know, that every American doesn't have enough food not to go to bed hungry at night and what's going on in Ukraine. And and I, I mean, I, you know, and I started by saying I, I have issues with the, the violence, the danger of football. Well, and maybe it again, it is just the celebrity status that happens with that. And uh, I'm going to make probably a quick 90 degree segue, but it also shows you what people can do when they do get motivated, crusade for children. I mean, most of those kids that are helped are anonymous kids. Mm -hmm. And yet a tremendous outpouring of the community happens to respond to the need that has been highlighted at that moment. Mm -hmm. That's not to say again, there's not a lot of other needs out there. And as you were saying, I think Galia, that. Uh, and certainly the um, guy has, I know other charities, and so I think people are trying to say, well, what would he want us to do at this time? Now, maybe a different time of year, he might have said, no, let's help the people in Ukraine, let's help whatever. Uh, but as a reminder to all of us, there's so many choices we have to make about you know, what 
charity, what we're going to give to, how we're going to support, but all of us are called, you know, regardless of whatever our opportunities are, given the, the blessings we receive, be good stewards, and to in turn respond out of that mindset of, of uh, giving back to help others based on the blessings we receive. I also think it pointed out how very fragile life is. Oh, yes. How often take it for granted, whether it be a nine-year-old that happens to, to come down with cancer, that's, that's a tragedy. But we, we just assume that when they go out on that field to play, everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. We just make the, the assumption that we, when we get in a car to drive back and forth, everything's going to be okay. We make these assumptions that life is going to go on and we never think that in an instant it could stop. And, and half a second stopped the way it stopped on that football field the other night. Absolutely right, panel. And also uh, worth noting, I always thought to myself that these people, the players, we think of them as these big giant people. They're only 24 and 25 years old and 23. And that's not terribly mature, at least for most of us here. We remember that. <laughs> we weren't terribly mature. And to see them react the way they did, I agree with everything you said. But the outpouring of support was certainly special and one we'll all remember. And, Bill, I'll talk to you later. I'm a Bears fan, so we'll talk about the Packers and Bears. It's a shame. Yeah, it's a shame. You know, I can pray for your conversion. You know, I'll pray for your for your soul. Yes. That's the first time this program, paying for <laughs> someone praying for a conversion. Thing of the new year. <laughs> Uh, one quick, uh, one, one final topic, and we only have about a couple minutes left, but a step to clean up the ocean off the coast of Hawaii. Commercial fishermen have been offered a bounty to collect derelict fishing gear, which often kills marine animals, and then they bring the debris back to shore. So turning to our panel, your thoughts on this, bringing back this old gear, and whether a similar plan can help us clean up our part of the world right here. What could we do? Well, I think it's a great program. I am totally supportive of that. I haven't used a plastic straw in years. Um, these ghost nets, they're like abandoned fishing nets or they get lost accidentally or whatever. I mean, if you've seen pictures of sea turtles or whales or, I mean, the whole purpose of the net is to make sure that the animal gets trapped and suffocates because it can't go back up for air. Um, they're paying the the fisher people to bring these in and based on its dry weight and whatever they have enough, they think to do this program for two years. And I, I think it's great. And the incentivization of that for people, uh, it's positive. I mean, I like to think if a, somebody out there fishing came across one of that stuff, they'd just pick it up on their own. Uh, but having said that, if it helps motivate, the same would be true. I would hope people clean up our Ohio River or our, those who feed it, Bear Grass Creek, whatever it may be without being incentivized, but if that's what it takes, then all the more reason to put your focus on those moments where it is possible to make a difference. And Harriet, perhaps, don't you have the last word, have a few seconds left, go ahead. Perhaps this story will um, do just that, just give us the boost we need in this new year to pick up the litter around us, uh, to look at the surroundings in which we live and that which we've been given to care for. Well, thank you, panel. That'll bring to a close this edition of Moral Side of the News. Thank you, Bill Hammer. Sally McLean had to drop off our call, but thank you also to Harriet Aikens-Bamman and Galia Rooks. Thank you, panel. See you next time on Moral Side of the News. So long. <laughs>